We watched a lot of the Olympic Games uh, last few weeks. Holly especially likes the opening ceremony. As we were watching the Parade of Nations, there was a, a surprising number of countries that I had never heard of before. Some I wouldn't dare to try to pronounce the names of. But one of them I'd never heard of was Andorra. I thought that was Samantha's mother on the old bewitched situation comedy. But no, it turns out it's one of the smallest nations in the world, about half the size of Stark County with a population about equal to Cantons. Now, I said it's one of the smallest, but it's not the smallest. That honor is reserved for the kingdom of Monaco. Monaco is a kingdom that's less than one square mile in land mass. That's smaller than East Canton. Can you imagine a kingdom that size? I wonder how that goes over when kings have their annual conventions and they're comparing notes with one another. And one of them says, well, I rule over 100 million people. And another one says, my kingdom is the size of five million square miles of land mass. And the other one says, yeah, well, I'm the king of East Canton. I mean, you know, it just wouldn't compare, right? And that's kind of Tuval or, or, or Monaco's uh, uh, honor. They're, they're the smallest in uh, the world. Another nation I'd never heard of was the kingdom of Tuvalu. That sounds like a whimsical way to say goodbye. Tuvalu, I don't know. <laughs> But it's actually a nation, 11 square miles of long, narrow islands out in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. There are only 11,000 people in the kingdom of Tuvalu. That's about the population of Louisville. Land is so scarce there that they are unable to build a track for their Olympic athletes. And so they practice by running on the airport runway. How secure might that feel? I mean, imagine yourself, you're there lined up in the blocks and a gun goes off and you take off spreading and suddenly you hear the roar of a 747 behind you bearing down upon you. I guess it would probably make you run a little faster. Maybe there's a method to their madness. The newest nation in the world is South Sudan. It was formed in 2011. That new and little nation already has a men's basketball team that went to the Olympics. And it isn't just a bunch of ragtag throw-togethers. They almost beat the U.S. men's team in a pre-Olympic exhibition game. It took a last-second shot by LeBron James for them to beat South Sudan. I did a little research on this concept of where all these nations have come from, and I found out that 34 new nations have been formed in the world in the last 30 years. And about an equal number have ceased to exist in that amount of time. Teaching us a lesson that history already has taught us. And that is that kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Daniel actually gives us a picture of that in the second chapter of the Old Testament book by his name. The king of Babylon, whom Daniel served, had a dream about 600 B.C. Daniel, a Jewish prophet who had been taken captive and lived in Babylon as a, a slave, interpreted that dream for him. God gave Nebuchadnezzar that dream in order to make a prophetic statement about Babylon and about three kingdoms that would follow it, each of them replaced by the next one coming. And then, according to that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, a new kingdom would arise out of very humble beginnings, and it would become the greatest kingdom in the history of this world, triumphing over and displacing every other kingdom. That kingdom is the kingdom of God. The church is that kingdom. That's our image of the church today as we continue in our sermon series. The church is the kingdom of God. Let's set a little background before we actually read Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's prophetic interpretation of it. Babylon was the most powerful nation in the developed world in that time. It was composed of modern-day Iraq and Syria and Jordan, and Turkey, and part of Egypt. 
It was 15 times larger than the little nation of Israel. So that when Babylon attacked Israel in 605, it was no contest. It was over quickly. The remaining Jewish people who were left alive after the battles that took place were all taken as slaves and scattered throughout the empire of Babylon. Some of the more promising were kept in the city's cat or the nation's capital in service to King Nebuchadnezzar. One of those was Daniel, a young man who was a prophet. Since he was a prophet of God, he was highly respected. It was thought that he had some communication in a special way with one of the gods of power, and Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be able to, to tap into that if he ever needed it. And so he kept Daniel in his employ. Nebuchadnezzar's dream troubled him. It seemed more like a premonition, and he wanted to know what it meant. So he inquired of all of his wizards and his sorcerers, whose occupation it was to read the stars and to know what God's message to mankind might be and to interpret dreams and visions. So let's read that. Beginning of the story, Daniel chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar was a little bit smarter than that. He didn't want to just tell them what he dreamed and then have them come off with some off-the-wall opinion that just was the first thought in their head as to what his dream meant. He wanted to know that they really had the power to interpret dreams. And he believed that if they had the ability to know what he dreamed, then that same power would be able to interpret the dreams, some divine power. And so verse 5 tells us, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. How's that for motivation? And they could not tell him what the dream was. And so the king fulfilled his promise. He began killing off all of his wise men, all of the magi of Babylon. And he called for Daniel to be brought in for the same treatment because in his mind, Daniel was just like all the rest. They claimed to have some otherworldly connection to the gods, but they didn't really because they didn't know what he had dreamed. And so he was going to kill Daniel too. But Daniel said, wait, king, let me inquire of God and perhaps he will reveal the dream to me. And so Nebuchadnezzar gave him time and God did in fact tell Daniel what that dream was. And Daniel then repeated the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Let's read that. Going back to Daniel 2, verses 31 through 33. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. God gave Nebuchadnezzar that dream in order to convey a message to him and to the rest of the world. And part of that message was this, God determines kingdoms. He is the power which permits earthly empires and Daniel gave God that credit when he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. Before he told Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was or even began interpreting it, he gave credit to God. He gave glory to God for that revelation as we read in verses 27 and 28 of our text. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. And then in order to affirm this concept, he told Nebuchadnezzar, in fact, you are here only by the grace of God. We read that in verse 34, I think, 37. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. 
The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. He is Lord over all. It is by his approval that anyone exists. Mankind might proudly claim the achieving of success, but it is God who allows anyone to achieve. God determines kingdoms. The second lesson in this vision, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, was this. God and his kingdom are superior to all human kingdoms. In this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, he saw this statue that represented four kingdoms. Each part of the statue was a different metal. Each one of those metals represented a different kingdom. The first of those was represented in gold. As we see, we'll see in verse 38, when Daniel, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, said, In your hands God has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire were represented by the head of gold. God made Nebuchadnezzar king of that first great kingdom which would rule the known world. Nebuchadnezzar must have been convinced that that was true because as we read in the next chapter, he built a great statue of himself out of pure gold. Then Daniel addressed the second part of the statue, the silver chest and arms. We read that in verse 39. He says, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Another kingdom will come along. That one represented by the silver thorax. It was the Medo-Persian Empire. We know from history that that kingdom defeated and replaced Babylon. And although Daniel did not name that kingdom here, he did name it a few chapters later when he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, telling him that his days were numbered. Let's read that in Daniel 5, verses 26 through 28. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found lacking. Your kingdom is divided And given to the Medes and Persians. And that kingdom lasted about 200 years. And then it was replaced by a third kingdom. The kingdom represented by bronze in the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We see that as we go back to verse 39. When Daniel said, next a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. The bronze abdomen represented the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire was established by Alexander the Great. He conquered the known world. The Greek army used bronze helmets and bronze shields. Daniel identified them by name in chapter 8, 250 years before the Greek Empire actually existed. In that chapter, Daniel reveals that he saw a vision himself. It was a vision of a goat and a ram. The male goat had only one horn, and yet it killed the two-horned ram. And God told Daniel what that dream meant in Daniel 8, verses 20 through 22. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. That was the next kingdom that was coming along after Babylon. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece. The empire of Greece didn't even exist yet. And the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. We know from history that the Greek empire conquered the Persians. Daniel prophesied that their first king would be broken and his kingdom would be divided four ways. Alexander the Great died at age 34. Not having any children to leave his new kingdom to, he left it to four generals. One of those became dominant over all the others and usurped them and that new kingdom became eventually the Roman Empire. 
which leads us to the fourth nation represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That represented by iron. Let's read that in verse 40. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks stains to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. The iron legs represented the Roman Empire. That empire was so powerful that historians would later describe it as ruling the world with an iron fist. Rome possessed superior iron forging technology and therefore became known as the Iron Kingdom. The image in that dream consisted of the iron feet being mixed with clay, as we see in verses 41 through 43 of our text. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Daniel predicted that the Roman Empire would become a divided kingdom. Because of that, the empire would crumble. Constantine, the Roman emperor, divided the empire in 33 AD. The western half was centered in Rome. The eastern half was centered in Constantinople, named after himself. Weakened by that division, the empire became a target of attacks and eventually fell. What an amazingly precise prophecy. Some of it foreseen 1,000 years before it took place. That is one of the reasons I trust the Bible. No man could have made those predictions with that kind of accuracy, naming kingdoms and including details before they existed, one right after another, and been correct every time. This book is of divine origin. This is the word of God. We can trust what this book says to us because these are God's words to us. Let's see what God said about us in the rest of that vision and its prophetic interpretation. The third truth that God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and through Nebuchadnezzar was this. God will establish his kingdom. And we are part of that kingdom. His would be a spiritual empire. Let's go back to our interpretation as Daniel gave it in Acts chapter or Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 through 35. He's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar again, and he tells him, While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This new kingdom had humble beginnings, but not humble creation. It was not created by human hands, leaving just God's as its creator. This final kingdom would be one of God's own creation. And he told us when that kingdom would come to be. Let's go back to our text and read verse 44. In the time of those kings, let's pause right there. This verse follows immediately after the description of the Roman Empire represented by the bronze and the bronze mixed with clay, or the, I'm sorry, the iron and the iron mixed with clay. In the time of those kings, the Roman kings, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure 
forever. Do you know what empire Christianity was born under? The Roman Empire. It was during the reign of the Caesars that Jesus was born. When Rome controlled that little nation of Israel and the larger nation of Greece and the larger nation that had been Babylon and part of the nation that had been that of the Medes and Persians. The Roman controlled all of that. That was the Roman Empire. And the church was born in that time period. The church is God's kingdom. The church helped cause the demise of Rome. The website history.org states, one of the many factors that contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire was the rise of Christianity. Daniel predicted that 1,000 years before it took place. God's kingdom will come. It has come. God's kingdom will cover the entire world and be rooted deeply and be as unmovable as a mountain. It is the church. The church is spread worldwide. The church will never lose its place in this world until Christ returns again. When Gabriel made the birth announcement of Jesus to Mary, he told her this about her son-to-be, his kingdom will never end. When Jesus began his public ministry, he began immediately preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. He spoke about it constantly. 126 times he referred to the kingdom of God in the Gospels. That was Jesus claiming the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy through him. Jesus came to establish God's kingdom, and we are part of it. Colossians 1.13 tells us, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. The church is God's kingdom. Oh, it had humble beginnings, but it has, it has become so influential that it has spread across the globe. It has changed the world, converting many other kingdoms into Christian nations. We are a part of that kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom destined for triumph. God determined the destiny of the church thousands of years ago, that it will survive any threat, that it will outlast any attack, that it will still be standing when the denunciations of faith fade away. If we remain faithful to God's will, we shall prevail. We will prevail over the kingdoms and the twisted philosophies of mankind. The church will continue to exist when everything else is gone. God has predetermined that triumph for his church. And now he has placed that kingdom in our hands. He has put it under our leadership he has made it at least partially dependent upon our faithfulness to his call and to his will. And so I issue this challenge to the Louisville Christian Church. Let us always be a church which advances the kingdom of God. Let's live in love, which is the language of God's kingdom. Let's teach the truth, which is the ethics of God's kingdom. Let's save the lost, which is the mission of God's kingdom. May this church be a kingdom-focused church, growing, rooted deeply, overcoming, serving the Lord. Reports have been coming in for decades now that while the Catholic Church and the liberal Protestant churches are in decline, Bible-believing and Bible-teaching churches experience consistent growth, just like this one. And there's a reason for that. The prophet Amos told of a time when people would hunger and thirst for God's word. We are living in that time. When we see such moral uncertainties and such ethical inconsistencies that exist in our culture right now, people want 
something they can believe in. They don't want a church which merely teaches the ancient traditions developed by theologians in the Middle Ages like the Catholic Church does. Nor do they want a church which continuously adapts to the latest moral trends of the culture as liberal Protestant churches do. They want to know what the truth of God is. They want to know what is right because God says it is right. And the church which teaches God's word will grow. He has called us to be a part of that kingdom. He has promised his hand to guide and to bless the efforts of and to be with in every way that kingdom. He has prophesied through Daniel and through others that that kingdom would always be triumphant. We are a part of a kingdom that will never die. A kingdom that when history of of the human race on this earth has come to an end will continue to be triumphant throughout eternity. That kingdom is yours. And if you are not a citizen of that kingdom, it's only because so far you've not chosen to be. And God offers you the opportunity to accept him as your king and to live as a part of his kingdom. If you'd like to make that commitment to him, if you'd like to accept that offer that he makes, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing our invitation hymn.